seek out the bull tree. It's it's not too difficult to get to it. And I would say just as simple as going to that that view from Inspiration Point. When you go there now, it's the tunnel view, and the the、um, cars are there, and the buses. Well, there's a little path behind it. You walk up about a mile up the hill, and you're at the old Inspiration Point, and there's nobody there. So if you just、um, make that effort to get away, I mean, it, it's.、Um, Crowds are there because we we love this beautiful place. But you can find those moments of inspiration, and I encourage people to go and go in the off season if you can. I was just there last October, and it was such a great time to be there. Fewer people, the weather's still good, and you can find solitude and and that spiritual thing that that Muir was encourages encouraging us to go get in touch with. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining this American Inspiration event presented by American Ancestors, New England Historic Genealogical Society, and the Boston Public Library, ably produced by GBH Forum Network. I'm Margaret Talkett, Director of Literary Programs at American Ancestors (NEHGS) and a producer of this series. All of us behind the scenes are delighted you're with us tonight in the land of history, looking at our country's natural splendor, particularly the advocates behind its preservation and the creation of our national parks. Now, for more about this evening, over to you, Kristen, my BPL counterpart, to introduce Dean King, and we'll start right up. Thank you, Margaret. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this late summer evening. I'm Kristen Motti from the Boston Public Library Programs team. We're so glad to be here with you, our and our partners this evening, and of course, featured author Dean King. I have the honor tonight of telling you all a little bit about our featured author. Dean King is an award-winning author of ten nonfiction books, including Skeletons on the Zahara, Unbound, Patrick O'Brien: A Life Revealed. And the feud. His writing has appeared in Granta, Garden and Gun, National Geographic Adventure, Outside, New York Magazine, The Wall Street Journal, and The New York Times. He is the chief storyteller、um, in two History Channel documentaries, and a producer of its series Hatfields and the McCoys: White Lightning. He has appeared on numerous broadcast programs, including NPR's Talk of the Nation, ABC's World News Tonight, and PBS's American Experience. We're thrilled to have him share his story with us this evening. Dean King, welcome, and over to you. Thanks, Kristen. Thanks, Margaret. It's a real pleasure to be here tonight. Thank you, everybody, for for tuning in. And、uh, I look forward to、um, walking you through a little bit of, of John Muir's life and his impact on our lives, and、um, telling you a little bit about my research and reading a few passages from the book. So,、um, and, and I, I love answering questions. So please do、um, pop in, in any questions you have.、Um, why don't we、uh, just、uh, hop on the my, my PowerPoint show here,、um, and we can skip over the, the the cover of the book slide, I think, and go right to number two.、Um, So、uh, this is the view from Inspiration Point, the view of Yosemite Valley, the the famous view, and you have El Capitan there、uh, to the left and、uh, Bridal Veil Falls to the right.、Uh, that's just a, a, one of Muir's great, simple, pure, you know,、uh, sayings. The mountains are calling, and I must go. That speak, I think,、um, uh, speaks so、uh, profoundly to us.、Uh, in 1998. I、uh, was.、Uh, I had my first view of the valley. My mother-in-law had gotten a cabin there for my father-in-law's 70th birthday, and being an East Coast kid, I came to this view, and was stunned. It did what it was supposed to do. It inspired me, and I knew immediately that I wanted to、uh, spend time、uh, in this place. It changed my. Really, my understanding of what America was just seeing this landscape—it was so powerful, and so、um, I started looking into it and discovered John Muir. I discovered that John Muir had written profoundly about it, beautifully about it, and、um, that、uh, that he was、uh, the sort of narrative link to history and and to、um, what was very powerful about the place. Lenny Marsh Wolf,、uh, his biographer, wrote、uh, a Pulitzer Prize-winning biography、uh, in 1945. It was published, 
And uh, I read that and I realized that Muir's life was sprawling. And, um, and, and so I was looking for, the, for the, the story here, the narrative that told us what we needed to know about John Muir, what was important about him, what he did, and why we should um, keep uh, studying him and, and um, how he might inspire us. Uh, and so that was really the, the beginning of this book. Um, next slide, please. Um, Muir was born in, uh, in 1838 in Dunbar, Scotland. And uh, as, as a, a, a young boy, his grandfather took him out uh, along the coast, Dunbar's on the coast, and he would look in tidal pools and see the waves. He, he fell in love with, with nature. His father was a strict evangelical Christian and uh, decided that he needed more religious freedom and wanted to go to the United States. So they immigrated to uh, the United States in 1849, the same year as the gold rush, uh, but they went to Wisconsin and um, Muir worked on the family farm for uh, about 15 years. Uh, it, was, it was really a tough labor. The dad was a, a taskmaster, and uh, they worked, um, Muir and his siblings worked from uh, dawn and until dusk every day. Uh, he only allowed the Bible in the house, but Muir had all these various uh, interests. And, uh, and, and so he would smuggle in novels to read. Eventually, um, uh, his father got irritated about that. And he said, all right, John, you can read, but only if you get up in the morning uh, before work, uh, I'll allow you to read, you know, whatever you want to read. So um, Muir, uh, Muir loved that. He invented a machine using a clock that would pull the legs out from the front of his bed and dump them in a pan of cold water at 1 a.m., so he started reading whatever he wanted to read at 1 a.m. He was that curious, that intellectual, really um, that brilliant. Um, and, and so that was, uh, that was how he um, expanded his, his thinking, his mind at the time. And uh, so here you have Dunbar Scotland uh, in, in, the, in the picture. Um, and, uh, and, and that's a statue that's on the streets there in, in Dunbar, even though he left at the age of 11. Um, they still really honor and revere uh, his legacy there in Dunbar. And I encourage you to visit uh, if you get a chance. There's now also a national trail that goes across the country um, that's, that's in honor of, of Muir. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. So imagine if uh, your college roommate showed up and couldn't afford a desk. So he designed one, uh, whittled the parts out of wood and built it there. And it looked like this. Uh, pretty spectacular uh, desk, and I'd read about Muir's inventions, and um, and and it really didn't hit home how uh, unbelievable they were until I went and saw this one at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. It's still there; you can see it. The parts are beautifully carved. He uses clockwork, and that that the table at desk rotates every 15 minutes when it's turned on, so that Muir could have his book there and stay on his study schedule. So he was an unusual uh, kid. At, at Madison, his room became sort of a combination museum and freak show. Everybody had to come to John Muir's room and see all of his inventions, all of the, um, the natural history things he was collecting and keeping in jars around the room. Uh, he spoke a sort of a Scottish inflected dialect, uh, but, but with beautiful concrete language from the farm. Uh, his professors uh, really admired him and knew that he was an interesting, unusual person. He, um, he started reading uh, Emerson there, found professors that he really admired and um, took to nature uh, at, at that point. Um, and so, uh, but he didn't have much money and he had to work. So he worked as a school teacher. He worked in manufacturing. He would go work in a factory that was making broom shovels or, or uh, I mean, sorry, um, broom handles or shovel handles. And uh, he would work there for a couple of weeks and then he'd go to the owners and say, look, um, we need to change a few things. And he would then retool the whole manufacturing line and uh, it would work, you know, 200% better. So every place he worked really uh, uh, loved him there. Uh, he had, uh, there was an, uh, an accident at one of the, the factories and he got stabbed in the eye with a, a needle that he was using to fix uh, uh, part of the manufacturing line. And, uh, and he was temporarily blinded. And at that point, he, he reconsidered 
Um, he knew he wanted to do something good for humanity. He thought, I could be a medical doctor. I could be an inventor. I could be um, a manufacturer. And he really did, you know, that might be a little ironic that Muir wanted to be a manufacturer, but he knew that, that manufacturing would be good for um, humanity, that he could do something positive there. But um, when, when he had this accident, he decided, you know what, my true love is really studying nature. And, um, and he loved nature so deeply that he decided at that point that I'm going to uh, pursue that. Of course, he, he did his famous walk then across the South um, to the Gulf uh, of Mexico, uh, just shortly after the Civil War, uh, a great adventure. And when I first started looking into Muir's history and wanting to write about him, I thought, oh, this is fantastic. I'm going to go do this walk and write about it. Well, as I figured out what this central narrative is, this narrative that we need to know and that it needed to be simplified because he went to Alaska, he traveled all over the world, he did so many things, that, um, that story actually became a paragraph in the book. So um, there's a lot left on the table here if you get interested in Muir to pursue, but really my book is this um, important chain of events that um, Muir and his editor, uh, Robert Underwood Johnson, uh, made happen. And I'm going to get to Johnson in a second, but uh, let's go to the next slide. And I want to read you a, a passage um, from the book that it, is Muir having his uh, uh, very profound moment looking over Yosemite Falls. After walking across the South, he, he made his way out to, to California and, and famously walked from uh, San Francisco, took the ferry to Oakland and walked uh, to Yosemite Valley. Uh, fell in love with it and spent some time being a shepherd there. And as he's uh, working with the shepherd, he comes down uh, above Yosemite Falls and he looks 5,000 feet um, over uh, down into the valley. And when I read Muir's words here, um, this, is, this is my version, but um, some of it's uh, quoted from Muir. It, it spoke to me very deeply. Wishing to be part of this God work as nearly as possible, Muir took off his shoes and stockings and pressing his feet and hands against the slick granite, worked his way down until his head was near the booming, rushing, energizing stream. Noticing that it leveled before its dive, he hoped he could lean out over the edge and see down into the falling water and threw it to the bottom. But when he reached the edge, he discovered it to be false. Another steeper ledge lay below. It appeared too steep to allow him to reach the brink. However, he could not convince himself to abandon the effort. He could see the cliff fully now and spied a narrow rim just wide enough to hold his heels. Studying the polished surface of river wall, he noticed a seam, a fault line that might provide the needed finger holds to reach the cliff's edge. His nerves tingled as he considered his next move. The reverberation of the water enveloped him, and he began to feel a part of it, a giddy mix of emotions, elation, wonder, fear, swam in his head. He decided again not to move forward, but then he did. Some inner wildness had taken over. The slope was not his enemy. He was a part of it. He crept forward, and when he reached the small ledge about three inches wide, planted his heels on it. Then he shuffled sideways like a crab toward the precipice, 30 feet to go, 20 feet, the water beside him now white and agitated as it sped to its threshold, 10 feet. At last, the edge was right in front of him, legs firm, body stiff, arching. He peered over, his eyes bored into the billowing freefall, and he watched the spill separate into streamers, comets of water whose tails refracted the sunlight. As the creek flowed past him on its grand adventure, his body and soul seemed to hang there, somewhere in between terra firma and air infinitum. Another current, Emerson's words, he well knew, in the woods we return to reason and faith. There I feel nothing can befall me in life, no disgrace, no calamity, which nature cannot repair. Muir lost any sense of the passage of time and later could not remember his retreat from the ledge. Although a slip of the heel could have sent him over with the powerful creek, the magnificence of the fall, its ever active and changing form, its rumble and sudden silence, its action and refraction, its immediacy and its distance had him spellbound. So many stimuli bombarded his senses that there was no room for fear. Instead, where earth and water met air and light, Muir with the religious fervor of his upbringing saw God. 
He saw God in the fragmentation of the stream and in the rays of the sun passing through to make vivid rainbow beads. He saw God in the rebirth of the stream, suddenly expelled from earth as death and a new life, a new journey were simultaneously manifest. So when Muir had that experience and I read about it um, and, and seeing that he could see that fall go over the ledge and envision this death and rebirth, uh, a new life in the valley, to me, that, that was special. It really spoke to me. And, and I knew, um, you know, uh, this was a, a special mind at work. And, uh, and, and so he took all that uh, religious zealotry of his father and his upbringing. He knew the Bible. He had the Bible verses whipped into him a, as a kid. Uh, he, he, he knew the New Testament by heart and most of the Old Testament as well. Um, but he had to reckon with all that. And here he found that come together in nature. Uh, nature was going to be the, the great vehicle for him. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. So here I am. This is uh, the edge of Yosemite Falls. You can see um, I, I'm there in winter, and uh, there I, I have a. I don't know if you can see it there, but there's a railing. But you can you can look down and see how steep that uh, that that cliff is. And Muir really he he lacked the fear gene. He he had uh, he would go right up to a ledge. He would scale waterfalls. Um, he did uh, amazing things. He was a great alpinist, uh, which is sometimes overlooked. But uh, he knew he wanted to be in Yosemite Valley. And uh, let's go to that next slide. Um, this is the Yosemite Valley in winter. And, and at the time, uh, there, there weren't many people. Again, we're, we're right here in, in the late 1860s, early 1870s. Um, he would explore there. He believed that, that um, glaciers had created uh, and shaped Yosemite Valley, which um, uh, the, the best science at the time did not think that. And he set out to prove it. He, he knew in his mind from his observations that, it, that that was the case. And so he went and um, uh, nailed in spikes to the glaciers and measured their movement and really proved uh, uh, against all odds that, that he was correct. Um, in the little inset there, you can see, uh, if you go to Yosemite Valley, look for this stone with that little plaque there. That's where Muir built his first cabin, uh, looking out on the falls. Um, Emerson, the poet Emerson, would come there uh, to visit him. And, uh, you know, so he made his reputation doing his scientific studies, writing about Yosemite Valley. Uh, a lot of famous photographers came out during those years and took photographs in Yosemite Valley. Um, which had been preserved by Abraham Lincoln during the Civil War uh, as a state park, uh, became a famous destination. Uh, still, though, only it was it was hundreds of people who were coming there, um, not not thousands or you know hundreds of thousands uh, as today. Um, uh, Muir so Muir uh, did that for several years. Uh, he eventually met in uh, uh, Louis Strenzel, the daughter uh, of a, a, a fruit farming family on, on the coast in Martinez, California. And um, we can go to the, the next slide. Um, thank you. Uh, and, and here, um, if you look at that inset, um, this is uh, Muir uh, and Louis Muir, his wife. She was a homebody. She liked to stay home. She loved the farm. She loved working on the fruit farm. But uh, and she didn't like hiking very much, but she did go to Yosemite Valley with Muir one time. And you can see he's, he's pushing her up the hill with his walking stick. And um, this humorous picture, Muir drew in a letter to their daughter, Wanda. They had two daughters. Muir was a, an extremely devoted family man. Uh, and uh, for, for a period of about um, 10 years, Muir was working on that fruit ranch, making it really his own. He was very good at it. He understood how nature worked. Um, and, and it gave him a lot of insight. He could later argue uh, when he wanted to argue that, that, look, if you save that valley the way Abraham Lincoln did without saving the land around it, the hillsides, and if you let the sheep come up and eat all the, the, um, the greenery and let it deteriorate and, and um, erode, um, it's like saving the, the palm of a hand without saving the, the fingers. You know, you need the whole thing to work together. Uh, and so, and Muir understood he could make the argument, look, we need the vegetation there to hold the snowpack to let the water seep in so that the water will be released so that farmers down in the valleys um, can get it in the late spring and summer when they really need it. And he knew that as, as a fact because he, he worked in that fruit farm. Um, uh, he was very good at the fruit farm, but it kept him out of the mountains. And he had made this reputation as a mountain man. He was writing for Century Magazine. 
Uh, but in 1889, his editor would come out. And uh, Louis was a, a very devoted wife. And she knew that even though Muir was really taking care of the farm, working side by side with her own father, John, Dr. John Strenzel, um, and uh, that that not being in the mountains was uh, was taking away from his health and also taking away from really his seminal work of of promoting nature in the mountains. And so she pushed him out of the nest. You can see um, this picture here is um, Muir uh, on, on the summit of Mount Rainier, on the sixth known ascent of, of Rainier. And it was a very dangerous uh, thing to do and, and can still be very dangerous to, to this day. Um, but this was Muir emerging from, from the farm and getting back out into nature at the same time. And uh, let, let's move to the, the next slide here. Um, his editor, Robert Underwood Johnson, uh, there on the left, um, who was 15 years Muir's junior. And there aren't many um, illustrations of, of him. So here he's older than Muir, but, um, but he, in actuality, he, he, he's a younger man than Muir. But, um, but he was a, a, a brilliant editor and um, I'll digress just briefly on him. He grew up in Centerville, Indiana. Um, and at the age of 11, he told his parents, I I'm gonna go work at the train depot. And they're like, what? You know, um, why are you going to do that? You're 11. You don't need, and it's during the Civil War. But he, like Muir, was precocious. He needed to get out. His mind was working rapidly. He goes to the depot, and it turns out he's great with the telegraph machine, uh, and so so good at it that there's another telegrapher who's sending rapid messages that the the older guys there can't really pick up, and so they stick Johnson on it. And Johnson's like, "Oh yeah, I can do this," and and takes down the messages. Well, the the other telegrapher is Thomas Edison. A young Thomas Edison at age 19 and Johnson's 11. And the two of them start sending telegra uh, telegrams back and forth, um, communicating with one another. It's during the Civil War. Johnson is sometimes taking down very sad messages about the sons of, of local families who've been killed in the war and even had to get on a, a pony and ride out and deliver one of those messages. Um, at the end of the war, when Abraham Lincoln is assassinated, it's Robert Underwood Johnson, who's at the telegraph machine, takes down the message and goes out on the, the platform and makes that announcement. So here's a guy who just um, is going to be in the thick of it. You know, there, he, he later moves to Chicago and is there during the, the Great Fire of Chicago. So um, uh, like Muir, um, it, it's, it's kind of almost fate or destiny that these two guys maybe were going to come together. Uh, and, and so here they are. They've been working together for a while. Johnson um, made his name during uh, uh, working for Century Magazine when they published a, for three years a series about the Civil War. And it's really one of the seminal pieces of our Civil War history. They interviewed uh, leaders on both sides of all the major battles and published these. Century's uh, circulation published, uh, 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 doubled from 125,000 to 250,000. Century became one of the um, uh, central cultural um, conversation pieces of the nation. And Johnson was right at the heart of that. To follow up on it, uh, they decided to um, do something about the gold rush, which meant Johnson got to come out to California. Muir and, and Johnson met in person in 1889. And Muir said, hey, um, you're here. Let's go to Yosemite. You, you've heard me, you know, you've seen me write about it. You've edited it. Let's, let's go take a look. And Johnson's arm did not have to be twisted hard. He said, yeah, let's do that. And so um, I'm going to read you a little, little piece about that. And um, let's see, I think we can, uh, well, we'll wait a second for the, for the next slide here. Uh, they go there and um, uh, the, the, even though the, 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 the Yosemite Valley is spectacular as, as always, there, um, there's rubbish, there's um, farming is going on in, in the valley itself, and uh, uh, there are horses grazing everywhere, the hotels are being built that are somewhat shabby, and so Muir's very uh, disappointing, he says, Johnson, um, let's, let's go, we're going to go up and see Tuolumne um, uh, Valley and Tuolumne Meadows, I'm going to show you a place that's more remote than this, and, um, and that, that you need to see. In the evening, they reach Soda Springs in Tuolumne Meadows at about 7,000 feet and set up their camp by the river. Muir and Johnson talked at length by the fire under a ceiling of stars until Muir tucked Johnson in with his feet toward the fire. The next morning after sunrise, Johnson would call it a revelation of glory as the clear sun came bounding over the solemn glacial peaks 
They set out to explore, heading through the open evergreen forests into Tuolumne Canyon, which Johnson later described as the wildest region ever haunted by the god of silence. One dense break of birch saplings nearly demoralized the editor, but he managed to squeeze through it into an open gorge at the base of a waterfall, descending from a thousand foot wall of granite. All along Muir, who leaped from rock to rock as surely as a mountain goat, according to Johnson, or skimmed along the surface of the ground, a trick of easy locomotion learned from Indians, chatted away, often ribbing Johnson for his lack of outdoor skills and inability to keep up. Now that he could see Muir in his element, Johnson was in awe of him. In the wilderness, he wrote, Muir looks like John the Baptist is portrayed in bronze by Donatello. He was spare of frame, full bearded, hardy, keen of eye and visage, and on the march, eager of movement. Farther into the canyon, a tailless scramble was complicated by stubborn manzanita, while Muir crossed the tricky boulders with deft certainty and magically avoided being jabbed by the shrub, uh, <clears throat> which concealed rigid trunks and branches beneath soft leaves, Johnson fell and floundered like a bad swimmer, as he described it, so that Muir had to give him many a helpful hand and cheering word. Johnson suffered multiple wounds from the manzanita and spitefully dubbed it an objectionable shrub. But the painful journey was not in vain. When he finally called it quits, he thought the resting place that Muir found him was one of the most beautiful spots he had ever seen, where the rushing river striking potholes in its granite bed was thrown up into a dozen water wheels 20 feet high. Uh, next slide, please. Here we have uh, the water wheels and you know, Muir, Muir kept a journal and he was a great writer. Uh, I mean, a great drawer. Uh, he loved to sketch. And you can see that wispy water uh, wheel where the water's rushing down and hitting these potholes. And, and here, um, and, and this is, uh, I think, you know, just a very tender picture of, of Johnson and Muir sitting on that ledge looking at, at, the, at the water wheels. Um, and so it, this trip was most certainly not in vain because Johnson said, Muir, you write me two stories. I'm going to publish them in Century Magazine. And I'm going to go down to Washington, D.C., and I'm going to put them on every congressman's desk and we're going to get a national park created. And when I when I uh, read about that, I thought, wow, um, that doesn't exist anymore. An editor couldn't say that to a writer and and get that kind of act, you know thing done. And I realized right then that that's what this book had to be about was the relationship between these two men and how um, Muir, this sort of nature philosopher king, was actuated by. Johnson, the editor, who kept his nose to the grindstone when it came to writing stories, and then actually made something happen with those stories. So not only would they go on to create Yosemite National Park, uh, this, this did indeed happen, they would, um, they would go on to um, uh, create the, the Forestry Commission that would create our national forests, uh, they would start up the Sierra Club, and they would um, uh, fight to save Hetch Hetchy when San Francisco wanted to take it, uh, a part of the of the national park that San Francisco wanted to take and, and um, create uh, a, a reservoir out of, which would lead to um, the establishment of our national park system. Um, so uh, it really is a, a magnificent uh, relationship that resulted uh, from the work of these two men together. Um, let's go to the, the next slide. Um, and here we have uh, the <clears throat> the Mark Twain tree. And uh, after uh, they created uh, Yosemite National Park, Muir wrote those two articles. Johnson ran them, went down to D you know D.C. and uh, they passed the bill. Um, Muir then uh, went out into the Sierra Nevada further uh, down to what's now Sequoia National Forest, Sequoia National uh, Park, and Kings Canyon. And Johnson was like, Muir, we got to do more. Look what happened. We got this done. Let, let's keep going. Um, I'm going to read a little passage to you uh, now. Um, Muir went down here, and what he saw was the sequoias just getting um, uh, <clears throat> chopped down uh, willy-nilly, and it, it was very upsetting to him. And, uh, and so uh, one of the first talks I did was uh, for, the, for the Mark Twain house for this book, and the moderator there said, you know, I've read this passage three times, and it brings tears to my eyes each time I read it. So um, I'm going to read that for you now. 
As the general noble tree fell in the Converse Basin Grove in 1892, a year after Twain's namesake met its demise, the giant sequoia lurched back against its stump in its death throes, as if admonishing the jubilant lumberjacks who had just severed the last fibers of what is believed to be the largest tree ever cut down. Uh, can we go to the next slide? This is the Twain tree, and the next slide is the general noble tree. The massive 3,000-year-old uh, sequoia, named after the sitting Secretary of the Interior, both until that moment still very much alive, sent them in leaping as it smashed scaffolds and rigging. They fell onto the wild, wildly vibrating stump, some 90 feet in circumference, the Chicago stump, as it would become known, and found themselves balancing on wobbly knees in the midst of their own self-induced earthquake. They would make a 30-foot tall cross-section of the tree, cleanly cut at both ends, hollow it out, and then prepare it for transportation to Chicago, where during the upcoming World's Columbian Exposition, it would be erected in the White City, in the rotunda of the government building, ringed by benches and outfitted with a spiral staircase. A rather tawdry um, ending for a, a, a tree that's thousands of years in the making. And even then, when people saw it, uh, they thought it was a hoax. They, they didn't believe it. It was so, so grand and so unbelievably big um, that, that they thought um, it, it had been concocted. Uh, so um, Muir had his work cut out for him. Uh, this was the age of uh, reconstruction, of industrialization, and the nation was just moving willy-nilly uh, across uh, the country thinking, you know, manifest destiny. We've got these uh, all these resources. They're never going to end. It's not a problem. Well, Muir was out there going, it's going to end. You know, you, you can't replace a 3,000-year-old tree. And he's in the Converse Basin, basin the, the, the largest collection of sequoias ever, where there's 6,000 uh, of these giant sequoias. And, um, and he's ringing the alarm, stop, we've got to stop. And, and, and Johnson tries to get the message down to DC, but they, they can't get it done. And so of those 6,000 trees, all were cut down, but 100. And uh, let, let's go to the, the next slide, please. Um, so this is uh, 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 a me right here that where the arrow is pointing and at, at the bull tree. Of the 100 trees left, the largest one, thankfully, the bull tree uh, was, was um, preserved. It's named after Frank Bull, the manager of the lumber operation that cut down the other 5,900 trees. So it's a little a bit ironic, but at least he did save this one tree. And um, it's very hard to get a photograph of a giant sequoia uh, to catch the perspective of it. And so that's what I'm trying to do in that second picture. That's me just uh, at, at the, the, the edge of that tree. It's magnificent. And I, I really wanna include this because you hear of the overcrowding in um, Yosemite and all these parks, but um, I drove in several miles on dirt roads and hiked a mile and a half in and sat with uh, one of the biggest trees on the planet right here in Sequoia National Forest uh, for, for an hour with my wife uh, and we, we had lunch and didn't see another person. So um, I do wanna emphasize that um, there are opportunities to get out in, in um, these parks and have amazing experiences. So um, this is when um, <clears throat> Johnson spearheaded putting together the Forestry Commission. Uh, Muir was uh, a unofficial part of that commission going around doing due diligence um, in the Western uh, states and to determine how do we save these forests? What do we do? You know, we're going to, we're, we're, we're cutting them all down. Um, and so this erudite body got together and, and proposed saving 21 million uh, acres of forest land. Uh, uh, but that was a controversial idea. Uh, and uh, the, the Western states weren't all for it. The, the timber operations uh, lumbering companies um, didn't want this land protected in this way. Um, and uh, I'm going to read to you a, a, a passage now. Uh, it was Muir, it became Muir's job after the proposed uh, preservation of this acreage to basically sell it to America. You know, how, how do you do that? Um, how do you convince everybody to get on board with this? And, and so they, they turned to our, uh, you know, our, our number one nature bard of the day, 
And um, this is a passage that Radio France International asked me to read. And, um, you know, and so I realized it was very uh, powerful in, in the context of Muir creating a really a, 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 a creation uh, myth for our force. And um, and then ringing the alarm. And uh, this ran in the Atlantic Monthly. In The American Force, that's the name of the story, Muir hearkened back to his religious roots with a poetic creation myth for the nation's woodlands. The force of America, however slighted by man, must have been great delight to God, for they were the best he ever planted, he began. The whole continent was a garden, and from the beginning it seemed to be favored above all the other wild parks and gardens of the globe. These forests were composed of about 500 species of trees, all of them in some way useful to man, and some were lordly monarchs proclaiming the gospel of beauty like apostles. To Muir's eyes, they were fully alive. Nature fed them, dressed them, loaded them with flowers and fruit. The wind rustled their leaves, exercised their fibers, and pruned them. He described their beauty in all seasons, and then rang the alarm. Even the fires of the Indians and the fierce shattering lightning seemed to work together only for good in clearing spots here and there for smooth garden prairies and openings for sunflowers seeking the light. But when the steel axe of the white man sang out in the startled air, their doom was sealed. The bread and money seekers denuded the Atlantic coast and devastated the Mississippi River Valley and the vast Great Lakes Pine region. Finally, an invading horde of destroyers called settlers crossed the Rockies to fell and burn more fiercely than ever, at last reaching the wild side of the continent and the great aboriginal forests of the Pacific coast. Clearing has surely gone, has now gone far enough, he argued. The remnant protected will yield plenty of timber, a perennial harvest for every right use without further diminution of its area and will continue to cover the springs of the rivers that rise in the mountains and give irrigating waters to the dry valleys at their feet. New York's Central Park, once vigorously opposed, was now praised and renowned, and he believed the same would be true for the national parks and forest reservations. There will be a period of indifference on the part of the rich, sleepy with wealth, and of the toiling millions, sleepy with poverty, most of whom never saw a forest a period of screaming protests and objection from the plunderers, but light is surely coming. That uh, passage that uh, I love, it captures so much in Muir, um, his deep faith, um, his ability to um, cast a story around nature that we can grasp and, and get. Um, his vision, you know, he, he wasn't this... Um, uh, nature purist. He had that manufacturing background. He understood that we needed to use our natural resources, but we needed to use them responsibly. And that's what he's doing here. He's, he's selling this pitch because he knows if, if we don't cre create these national forests, um, these, these trees are just going to get plowed down and we're not going to have any kind of sustainable forest. So this was um, um, his great contribution um, in that realm, and Johnson's as well, because Johnson was was behind this all the way. Um, he helped put together that that forestry commission, and Roosevelt, in some ways, would over overshadow them and, and steal some of the glory. But I don't think um, Muir and Johnson ever really, um, you know, you you could see in their letters back and forth a little bit. It irritated them a little bit, but as long as the good work was getting done, they were happy. Um, let's let's move to that next slide, please. Um, uh, this is a, a picture of um, women in the Sierra Club, and uh, jo uh, Johnson uh, told Muir, look, uh, you need to create an organization out in California that is fighting for nature. You know, so much is going on out there. I can do this in New York, but Californians don't want um, people in New York telling them what to do. You need to do it. And Muir said, Hey, uh, I'm I'm the nature guy. I go out in nature and I write about it, and that's my contribution. I, I don't lead organizations. This isn't what I do. Well, Johnson was a very um, great, stubborn guy. I, I love um, how he thought. He said, "Okay, well, um, I'm going to get this done." So he got together a group of um, of uh, academics at at Berkeley and other um, businessmen in the San Francisco um, Bay Area. He said, "Hey, have a meeting, create a, an organization." and um, invite John Muir and make him the president. And that's exactly what they did. They started the Sierra Club. Uh, John Muir was elected president. He didn't have any choice. 
Um, and he, he, he came to love this role. So he would serve in, in that role for the rest of his life from 1892 to um, uh, 1914 when, when he died. And um, I, I like this illustration right here because um, contrary maybe to popular belief, the Sierra Club was not created to protect the forest. The Sierra Club was created to bring people to the forest because Muir and those, um, the people who started it knew that you had to get people to buy in, to love the forest, to save the forest, to protect them and to use them. And Muir always believed, you know, all the way back from looking over that waterfall and seeing God and the beads of water and the refraction of the light, um, that, um, that this, it was his temple, it was his religion, it was the place where you found uh, spiritual redemption and meaning in life. And so that's what he wanted to do. He wanted to bring people um, to uh, nature. And here, you know, it was mostly uh, a, a masculine, a, a thing that men did, but now they're trying to get uh, women out there. They did high trips in the Sierra Nevada. Muir's own daughters uh, were a big part of it. Uh, uh, Berkeley undergrad graduate women came out there and started loving nature. Harriet Monroe, um, uh, the, the poet, would go and write a, a beautiful story, um, which is um, I have in the book, but you could go read her, her story from, from the time as well. Um, so th there, there, there's a lot here. I'm going to have to wrap up pretty soon. I'm going to speed through a little bit. Let's, let's move to that next slide. Um, uh, this is uh, Yosemite National Park. And you can see that hashed part up there is um, the, the part that was threatened by San Francisco wanting to take Hetch Hetchy Valley up there in that upper uh, northwestern uh, quadrant. Um, it, there's a beautiful valley there that Muir dearly loved, and um, it, it was a second Yosemite Valley. It's now under um, several hundred feet of water because uh, San Francisco wanted to turn it into a, a reservoir for, for water for the city. For a long time, the Sierra Club fought that. Uh, secretaries of the Interior and presidents sided with the Sierra Club. But in 1906, uh, when uh, the, the great earthquake and fire uh, happened in, um, in San Francisco, and let's move to that next slide, please. Uh, the, the, that, is, that is Hetch Hetchy Valley um, before the dam was built and it was flooded. Um, well, in 1906, uh, when when San Francisco burned down, uh, it gave them uh, some political capital, uh, and so they really um, pushed and and fought to get this done. Muir and the Sierra Club would fight it uh, for for many years uh, up until World War One, uh, and, and during that time, uh, Theodore Roosevelt came out. and let, Let's go to the next slide. And here is uh, uh, Roosevelt with Muir in that iconic photograph of the two of them together in um, Yosemite. Uh, and and they're, they're, there they are riding together. I'll read you one last passage here as I bring this to a, to a close um, because I, it, it's so powerful to me. Of course, Theodore Roosevelt um, is known for his um, contributions to the preservation of nature. And Muir again is on the scene uh, with Johnson in the background. Johnson got uh, Roosevelt to get a hold of, of Muir. And, and you're going to see in this passage um, how powerful that in, uh, ended up being. In word and deed, Roosevelt seemed revived. He had been on a whistle stop railroad um, trip, uh, drumming up interest for his running for a second term as president. He hadn't run before because he had uh, become president when McKinley was assassinated. So he was out there um, uh, uh, creating uh, well, political followers, um, uh, glad handing and doing a whistle stop tour. I shall never forget our, um, I shall never forget our three camps, he would later write Muir, the first in the solemn temple of the giant sequoias, the next in the snowstorm among the silver firs near the brink of the cliff, and the third on the floor of the Yosemite in the open valley fronting the stupendous rocky mass of El Capitan with the falls thundering in the distance on either hand. Back on his whistle stop tour, Roosevelt made use of freshly inspired elocution in the vein of his new friend Muir telling Sacramentans, lying out at night under the giant sequoias had been like lying in a temple built by no hand of man, a temple grander than any human architect could by any possibility build. And I hope for the preservation of the groves of giant trees, simply because it would be a shame to our civilization to let them disappear. They are monuments in themselves. And I ask that your marvelous natural resources be handed on unimpaired to your posterity. We are not building this country of ours for a day. 
it is to last through the ages. The president's deeds would be even more impressive. He would sign into existence five national parks, 18 national monuments, 55 national bird sanctuaries and wildlife refugees, refuges, sorry, and 150 national forests. Camping with the president was a remarkable experience, Muir later said. I fairly fell in love with him. And uh, it's safe to say that, that, uh, that uh, President Roosevelt fell in love with Muir and was profoundly influenced by him. Uh, even though Muir and Johnson lost that battle to save Hetch Hetchy during that fight with, uh, with Roosevelt largely behind um, them, they created a great grassroots movement uh, and, and uh, garden clubs, women's clubs, um, nature clubs all across the, the nation were sending in letters to Congress people, uh, uh, each one getting 5,000 letters on this desk, th their desk. That it had never happened before. They were like, what is this? Stop this. It's this madness. But um, it was the beginning of our grassroots uh, nature movement when people would fight for something that wasn't in their backyard, something that was much bigger, this national understanding of we need to protect our resources. And um, you know, here again, uh, Johnson and Muir were at work. And quickly, the, the next illustration, um, this is a, um, uh, a, a photograph that, that Roosevelt uh, sent to, to Johnson, signed by Roosevelt, that the family recently gave to me. And I, I'm just, uh, just so touched by that. Um, I wanted to show that uh, Muir died in uh, 1914, shortly after um, they lost that battle to save uh, Hetch Hetchy. And uh, the legend has it that he died of a broken heart, but he did not die of a broken heart. And I know this because in reading the correspondence between him and Johnson, Johnson was a little down by it. And, and Muir kept writing him, look, Johnson, we did the right thing. Right will prevail. Goodness will prevail. Uh, don't worry. You know, um, it's all going to work out. And um, I love that legacy. I think that can do attitude was his. Um, closing with the, this last slide. Um, really, these are the, the, the last words in my book. I'm going to let you read that. Muir was not uh, naive. Um, he knew that it was an, etern an eternal struggle and that, um, that we had to always be vigilant, it, you know, that there was a demand for using our force and natural resources, but he thought it was more spiritual than physical, maybe, and there's always going to be a balance there. And so, you know, that's what we're called to do is to be um, morally aware and, um, and to be involved in, in protecting our force, I think, the way Muir and Johnson were. Um, I'm going to wrap it up there. Thank you so much. Would love to answer questions in the remaining time. Thank you, Dean. That was a fantastic presentation, and it was really truly inspiring. Um, we're, I, we all feel quite moved. I know I do. Um, we'll turn to audience questions, but for now, I just want to remind all of you out there that signed copies of Guardians of the Valley are available from our partners at Porter Square Books in Cambridge, Massachusetts. If you could throw up that slide, Andrew. Um, popular history the way it ought to be written, says the Wall Street Journal. It shouldn't be missed. Um, you can, of course, get the book from your library, another great way. Um, if you want a signed copy, you can buy it from the bookstore, inputting the code AMINS23 as you order. Um, now for your questions, so many good ones have come in in advance. And also we've got some live ones in the chat. Thank you. Um, Kristen, do you want to start right in with some of those questions? Sure. Thank you, Margaret. Dean, thank you for your presentation. Um, our first question is from someone who submitted this when they registered, and it's where did you get all of your knowledge? How did you gather all of that background information that enabled you to write the book? Well, um, great question. I, I was very fortunate that um, the University of the Pacific has uh, preserved and digitized uh, their uh, uh, correspondence between Muir and Johnson, which was prolific. It took about six days for a letter to go across the country. So um, you, you have uh, you, some of these sort of Jane Austen-like uh, misunderstandings where one will write something and the letter hasn't gotten there and the other will write something and it's back and forth, but it's really wonderful. It's a conversation that went over, uh, you know, for four decades, they held this conversation. And so um, during COVID, uh, those were all digitized. So fortunately, I was able to spend a lot of time delving into those and teasing out that that conversation they were having. Of course, I went to uh, Yosemite. I went all around um, the Sierra Nevada. I uh, spent some time at the University of the Pacific. And um, uh, really, there's there was such a wealth of information, several very good biographies. Um, 
And uh, so the, the, that, that body of correspondence, though, I would say was, was probably um, the, the best thing I had. That in, in Muir's words, um, you know, uh, which are, are just amazing and inspired me. And I was able to, you know, I, I, I would quote when, when you just couldn't replace Muir's, you know, wonderful uh, descriptions. Uh, so um, uh, those, those were my chief resources. Another question that came in in advance, um, Yosemite was a great accomplishment of Muir's, but Hetch Hetchy was an unfortunate failure. Why did he fail? And uh, the other follow-up question is, what is your view on restoring Hetch Hetchy? If you could talk a little about that. Um, well, uh, okay, so there's a, a big chunk of the book that is about Hetch Hetchy. So uh, the, the process of what went on, San Francisco um, was, uh, uh, very ramped up to get that done. And they had a lot of muscle and power, uh, financial power behind it uh, and uh, great resources. And Muir and a couple of his uh, fellows at the Sierra Club funded their entire fight. And Muir, Muir would write Johnson and say, hey, Johnson, you go down to DC and you be there when Congress meets and I'll pay your expenses. You know, it was that bootstrapped, uh, you know. Uh, so it, it was really a David and Goliath battle. Um, but in some ways, you, you know, what they accomplished by um, energizing and activating this grassroots movement, that might not have ever happened if they hadn't been fighting this David and Goliath battle. So, um, so it really is a case of, of losing the battle but winning the war because the National Park Service was created in 1916, two years after Muir's death to prevent that from happening again, to say, look, our national parks are inviolable. A locality can't come and say, I need a piece of this and, and take it. Um, part of the reason why there were a lot of resources behind Hetch Hetchy was there was um, energy power and, and, you know, in addition to the water. So there were big financial stakes and um, there still is a restore Hetch Hetchy uh, movement. Ronald Reagan even uh, was behind restoring Hetch, Hetch Hetchy, and I think it might have been to tweak the liberals in San Francisco, but because now you kind of have a reversal there, uh, San Francisco's clinging to keeping um, that, that um, you know, wonderful water that they get out of the Sierra Nevada, and it's it's understandable, but my my feeling and hope is that one day that will get reversed and we'll, we'll get Hetch Hetchy back. Thank you. Thank you for that, Dean. Another question that we're seeing a lot of people ask about is Muir's interactions with indigenous people and um, his thinking on and whether they supported the initiative for the parks, um, how that what that landscape was at the time. That's that's a really um, great question um, and a very complex question. And there's a good bit in the book about it. Um, I, I, I think it's a great uh, misunderstanding and a disservice that the Sierra Club um, did when they um, suggested that that um, Muir was a, a racist. Let's let's be frank about it, because if you read his body of work and you understand um, what the situation was, you'll see that he, he is no, no way a racist. He has a uh, an engineering type mind. And, um, and he pulled no punches. So when he describes people, it's very graphic often. But, um, you know, just as in the passage I read about the pioneers, the, the invading hordes and, the you know, um, you, you know, he, he, he didn't spare anyone uh, and when he when he saw nature threatened or um, uh, or when he just encountered people in, in the wild. So um, I understand that out of context, it can seem uh, offensive, but but let's remember, this was the, the, the age of industrialization, the, the railroad you know, um, swept across the nation and we were just tearing down nature. Muir was fighting to save nature from capitalism, really rampant capitalism. And um, that was the battle he fought. Uh, so I think it's a little bit unfair to, um, you know, we, I, I, I do wish that he had maybe acknowledged the um, Native Americans more uh, at the time, but, but he was fighting such an, another big battle that was so threatening. It was literally just tearing down uh, the forest, the parks, destroying nature, um, and he was very uh, focused on that. Um, Native Americans uh, were, were largely had been removed from Yosemite during the um, gold rush as well before Muir got there. So um, 
Uh, anyway, it is, a, it is a, a question that a very good question, one that we should wrestle with, one that we should talk about, one that we, we should be very sensitive to. But I really think that Muir, while he wasn't perfect, he was a great and admirable hero, and we should honor him for what he did, and we should be inspired by it. And I don't think that um, there is a, a, a real reason um, not to do that. We've heard from a number of women who have grandmothers who were at UC Berkeley at the time of John Muir and um, studied botany, and many of them um, were uh, were the Sierra Club woman in the photo may have been my grandmother. Uh, my grandmother was one of those young UC Berkeley graduates um, who camped um, in groups with Muir in Yosemite Valley. And, uh, and a couple of them have asked, you know, what were the camping conditions like at that time? And also uh, how inspirational that he got uh, students out there with him. Can you talk a little bit about women inspired to enjoy the park, students inspired to enjoy the park, what was going on in that time period? Uh, that's wonderful. And I'm, I'm so grateful that that you guys have tuned in. People who've had grandmothers who are out there with Muir on these um, Sierra high trips. And that was something that the club organized with Muir was very much behind that um, to get the people, you know, get people, get the club uh, members out into wilderness. He knew that that's what we need. That That's the one thing we need to do is get people out there that go into the wilderness. They'll fall in love. They'll see what I see. And um, and so um, he he worked very hard. You know, he had two daughters that he was very devoted to, and they they were part of the club. They came on the high trips. Muir, Muir went on all the all the high trips that he could and was a very inspiring figure there. But i um, very grateful that also that that Harriet Monroe, the poet, uh, was on a high trip and wrote about it beautifully. Um, they um, they it was somewhat luxurious. They had cooks, you know, and when they moved, they had um, big teams moving from the valley up into Tuolumne Meadows. But they they hiked very, you know, when you're hiking out of Yosemite Valley and going, uh, you know, vertically almost a mile, it, it's hard. I've done it. It's not easy. Um, and uh, when they hiked down through um, Tuolumne, uh, from Tuolumne Meadows down to Hetch Hetchy through the Muir Gorge, uh, it's brutal. And, you know, so they experienced some pretty rough conditions in there. Um, here, I, I encourage you to read that chapter in the book, particularly, and maybe even go to the um, Harriet Monroe story. But um, I was quite taken with it. So I did focus on it a good, but she ended up going to Congress and testifying and getting a standing ovation. Her words were so powerful. So, um, yeah, it was a really a wonderful part of, of what the Sierra Club did at the time and part of the legacy. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. And could you, Dean, could you address, please, the um, relationship between, was, was Muir influenced by Emerson at all, by Ralph Waldo Emerson's work at all? That question came in with registration. Yeah. Um, so when when Muir hiked, he he often had Robert Burns's poetry in his back pocket and Emerson. Uh, and it, uh, he he at the University of Wisconsin, he had a professor who was into Emerson, and encouraged them to uh, his students to journal like Emerson. And that's where Muir started doing that. Um, he he was very devoted to to Emerson. And the 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 wife of that professor, Jean Carr, um, <clears throat> became <clears throat> one of Muir's mentors and a, kind of a, a soulmate. So when Emerson was coming out to see Yosemite, uh, she was very connected into the uh, academic establishment you know, in California. And she said, Emerson, when you go there, you need this guy, John Muir, as your, as your guide. And so Emerson went there. Muir was too shy. He sat there. Emerson didn't, you know, was a little bit older and, and he was a celebrity. So there were people around him all the time. Muir was waited until the last minute. He said, okay, you know, I'm here. And, and they, the two men met and really bonded and really admired each other and spent as much time as they could in the waning days. Muir tried to get Emerson to stay. And, um, and, uh, but, but Emerson's, um, caretakers basically wouldn't let him go out in the woods at that point. He was beginning his decline, um, uh, you know, a, a little bit elderly and, and not doing quite as well. And so it, it was it was heartbreaking when Emerson left and they were together and Muir watched the um, Emerson and his entourage leave. And he was heartbreaking. He felt lonely. He never felt lonely in the woods. It's a really um, amazing thing about uh 
um, you know, he could go out with with uh, a loaf of bread and some meat juice and some uh, tea or coffee and stay out in the, the woods for a week or two weeks and never lonely, love nature. But when Emerson left, he was kind of heartbroken. He he realized that something had been lost and he had to, he had to, he built a fire and sat there and it took him a day to get over and get back in touch with nature and realize, okay, I'm okay. I'm going to make it. But, um, y- you know, um, I think it's great that the two of them did connect and Muir remained inspired by Emerson and Emerson would write down that, that Muir was one of his guys. So um, I think it's part of uh, the, that uh, nature tra- tradition it was very much sort of handed on from Thoreau and Emerson to, to Muir. Thank you for that. Thank you so much. We are indeed, as Kristen said, coming to the end of our time. But uh, and Kristen and I are going to talk a tiny bit about other author talks coming up. But um, just really quickly from you, where should we go? Are there stumps to see that have been that we can wander into? If you were going to give us an upcoming event, Dean, that we should do out in the Yosemite Valley, any secrets for this crowd of like nearly four hundred, over nearly five hundred of us? Just can you tell us a tip, and we'll all meet there. Sure. Yeah, the bull tree. Seek out the bull tree. It's it's not too difficult to get to it. And I would say just as simple as going to that that view from Inspiration Point. When you go there now, it's the tunnel view, and the the um, cars are there, and the buses. Well, there's a little path behind it. You walk up about a mile up the hill, and you're at the old Inspiration Point, and there's nobody there. So if you just um, make that effort to get away, I mean, it, it's. Um, Crowds are there because we we love this beautiful place, but you can find those moments of inspiration. And I encourage people to go and go in the off season if you can. I was just there last October and it was such a great time to be there. Fewer people, the weather's still good and you can find solitude and, and that spiritual thing that, that Muir was encourages, encouraging us to go get in touch with. Thank you, Dean, for your presentation and for your book. What a wonderful way to end the summer, a summer evening, as Kristen said, uh, with a deeper understanding of our natural world, Yosemite Valley, and how it came to be preserved. John Muir and the birth of our national park system. We have so much to thank him for and also to thank you, Dean, for making us aware. Thanks, too, to the GBH Forum Network for all they do behind the scenes, Andrew and Frederic. Kristen and I are grateful and the team out there, all of you out there in Zoom land, thank you. We appreciate your interest and involvement, your love of history right alongside with us, your love of reading. Uh, We wish each of you a very good night. Thank you. Thank you.